Hi, my name is Kadex. In this video, I'll be discussing what I believe to be the easiest way to solo the Twisting Corridors as a warrior. In order to ensure that the success that I've had with the method I'll be describing wasn't due to luck with anima powers or getting easy debuff combos, I soloed Twisting Corridors Layer 8 three times, and all three attempts were successfully completed. It's worth noting that my Covenant is Venthyr, and as such, some of the anima powers that I pick are only available to Venthyr players, though these anima powers are not vital to the success of this method. Also, I do die a few times on the run that you're about to see. Those deaths were due to bad target prioritization and personal mistakes, rather than risks associated with using this method. When those deaths occur, I'll be explaining what I should have done in that scenario instead, which would have prevented the death. So with that, let's get started. It's easiest to do this run as arms because Die by the Sword allows us to completely negate all melee damage by giving us 100% parry when it's up. As for talents, the first row doesn't matter a whole lot. I started with Skull Splitter for the consistency early on, but eventually you'll be generating so much rage that the best first row talent is actually War Machine because it gives movement speed when we kill something. Getting impending victory is vitally important, and even though I'm Venthyr, going fervor a battle is preferred because some of the anima powers that we are looking to acquire just negate Massacre. Defensive Stance is the safer choice over Second Wind, but it will be slower as you'll likely need to stop and eat food in between some pulls. In this run, I went with Second Wind. If the first set of floor debuffs that you get is the Soul Forge's debuff, which does a percentage of your HP every few seconds, then Second Wind is useless, so just zone out and switch to taking Defensive Stance. I prefer to use Warbreaker over Cleave, because Warbreaker doesn't have a target cap, whereas Cleave does, though in my experience, it doesn't make a huge difference either way. Finally, you should get Avatar and Ravager as you normally would when going arms. The most difficult part of the run is the first half, as that's when we typically don't have any of the vitally important anima powers, so if you die early on, don't worry, it gets easier over time. Now, over the course of the run, you should be looking to get the following things. First, you should be looking to get 100% uptime on Die by the Sword. This is accomplished using the Unbound Fortitude anima power, Typically, you need two instances of this anima power to make that happen, though if you get lucky and get a Warlord's Resolve, which reduces the cooldown on Die by the Sword by 80%, then you'll only need a single rank of Unbound Fortitude. Second, you should be looking for tools to mitigate magic damage and also non-melee physical damage. There are a lot of options here depending on your luck with anima powers, also some of them are Covenant specific, so I'm not really going to say all of them because that would take forever, but in general you should be looking for these sorts of tools. Third, you want to make Execute or Condemn always usable. This is accomplished by using the Voracious Culling Blade Anima Power. Fourth, you're going to want a method of ensuring that you're going to get more Anima Cells. This can either be by generating more Phantasma, or by tools that force Anima Cells to spawn, such as Scratch Knife. Fifth, depending on which floor debuffs you get, you're likely going to want at least one Ravenous Anima Cell, which allows you to mostly negate the Soul Forge's debuff. Sixth, you want as many sources of damage multipliers as possible. And finally, you want as many Anima Powers that generate damage as you can get. With all that in mind, let's go back to the beginning of this run, and I'll be highlighting my decisions for each anima power that I get, and I'll also be talking about the little details and tricks that I use to complete the run. As you can see, the first torment that I get is Mortrigar, which increases magic damage taken. I personally think that this is the second hardest starting torment behind Soul Forges. For my first anima power, I pick Resonant Throat Bands for the damage multiplier, because Notched Axe Head has reduced value since I'm already running Impending Victory. It's worth noting that a lot of mobs that seem like they're part of large packs can usually be single pulled with Heroic Throw or Taunt. I do this a lot throughout the run, especially early on. Dead Soul Devil's first cast will always be Curse of Fragility. This should be Spell Reflected or Interrupted. Don't be afraid to use Intimidating Shout as an interrupt if both of them are on cooldown. I picked Pleonexian Command here to try and make it so that I can buy extra anima cells once I hit the third floor. It should be noted that the Phantasma gain occurs for each hit of Victory Rush, so a Sweeping Strikes Victory Rush will give twice the Phantasma. Next, I pick Murmuring Shawl because Dodge Chance works against ranged attacks, whereas Parry doesn't, so it's still useful to have even when we hit 100% uptime on Die by the Sword.
this pack is where I take my first death. I should have used Dwarf Shadows for their 40% dodge chance, and I also should have been targeting the Dead Soul Choruses, because their cast puts a debuff on you which reduces the effectiveness of your healing. This debuff cannot be spell reflected, and it stacks. If I interrupted and killed them first, I would have been fine. I picked Blade of the Life Taker here because unlike Vitality Guillotine, it will last the rest of the run. Also, it's a pretty ideal anima power because it provides more damage and more survivability, and it also scales as the run goes on. You'll see me using Dwarf Shadows and Heroic Leap a lot on these chain bridges. This is because with extra movement speed, getting on and off these chains can get really wonky and cause you to fall off sometimes. This was an incredibly lucky and also difficult choice to make. Pride Breaker's Anvil lets you effectively stun lock mobs when you get the Voracious Culling Blade out of a power, which is incredibly powerful against casters and will absolutely make the run easier. However, I went with Smoldering Inertia because that burst damage was just too good to pass up. I picked Offer of Souls because it's more beneficial early on in the run when you don't yet have a lot of soul remnants. It will also help me get to 100% Die by the Sword uptime faster. While incredibly lucky, getting Warlord's Resolve here is really only useful for this floor because I end up with two Unbound Fortitudes on floor 3, which would put me at 100% Die by the Sword uptime regardless. I take Blood Gorge Leech here because free healing is always nice, and also Golden Idol is useless if you're full clearing each floor like I am. Next I take Healing Elixir of Life because it's basically just a get out of jail free card. I make the exact same mistake that got me killed earlier and get the same result. I should have killed the Dead Soul Chorus first. I chose Gnarled Key because having an instant cast Door of Shadows with a shorter cooldown makes it super convenient, and it synergizes well with other Door of Shadows related anima powers.
I skip grabbing all the soul remnants on the chain bridges here, mostly because I'm lazy and running out to get all of them takes a long time. If I hadn't been as lucky with my anima powers at this point, I definitely would have grabbed them just to be safe. I like to grab the free anima cell first because the options might make it so that I don't have to buy one of the anima powers being offered by the vendor. Because I have Smoldering Inertia, I grab double time here so I can move faster and get the buff more frequently. At the vendor, I buy Unbound Fortitude, then I get all the plundered anima cells available, and finally I dump the rest of my Phantasma, getting Whirlwind Healing and more HP. From my plundered anima cells, I get another Unbound Fortitude, which ultimately makes my Warlord's Resolve meaningless. I then grab the 75 extra Phantasma because I personally hate the jump effect from Negation Well, and then I grab Writhing Noose because it's very strong by itself, and it interacts multiplicatively with Voracious Culling Blade, which I'm still hoping to get. While I could have safely bought a Ravenous Animus Cell on this floor, I chose not to because I know that I'll have the chance to buy another one on floor 6, and the next group of floors that would add a new Torment starts on floor 7. So here, Voracious Culling Blade finally shows up, and I immediately grab that so I can start working towards Condemn being usable regardless of the target's health. I take Resonating Effigy because I'm already immune to melee physical damage since I have a 100% chance to parry. With this, magic damage will still hurt, but will be far less scary, leaving ranged attacks as the last big concern, which I can somewhat avoid because I get 20 seconds of 40% chance to dodge whenever I use Door of Shadows, which conveniently turns into an 80% chance to dodge because I get another Murmuring Shoal from the chest. I grab Resonant Throat Bands because I'm starting to feel confident with my survivability, so it's time to start stacking damage modifiers. Now that I have two stacks of this, I'm going to start fishing for a 500% increased Piercing Howl duration anima power, as that's the best way to apply the Resonant Throat Bands debuff in my opinion. I grab the Warbreaker anima power so I can also run Cleave, which gives me yet another way of applying deep wounds in AoE situations. Whenever possible, I prefer to avoid picking anima powers that won't last the entire run, so once again I skip Vitality Guillotine, making it a choice between crit chance and HP. I went with the crit chance mostly because I was feeling confident with my survivability as I previously mentioned, and also you're more likely to see the health increase anima powers than you are to see the crit chance ones. Since I have Smoldering Inertia, grabbing Spattered Souls is really nice because it lets me increase the uptime of the 200% damage buff. At the vendor, I buy all the plundered anima cells, and then I grab the obvious choices of increased condemn damage, more resonant throat bands, and I go fishing for a 500% piercing howl duration. Then I decide to buy a ravenous anima cell with my remaining phantasma, just in case the next floor adds the soulforge torment. This turns out to be the right call. For my choice of epic powers, it was between Scratch Knife and Mask of Withering. Scratch Knife is incredibly good because it's an extra anima cell on every floor, and it'll also do like half the health of the elite at the end of the floor. The problem that I have with it is that I always end up forgetting to use it. So for that reason, and because I already had a ton of Dora's Shadows powers that synergized well with Mask of Withering, I went with that. Because of the next set of floors started giving the Soul Forges Torment, I was glad that I got the Ravenous Anima Cell. If you use it on one of the casters, such as the Moss War and Flame Tender like I do, the Anima Power that you'll get from that reduces all fire damage taken by 65%, which trivializes the Soul Forges Torment. At this point of the run, I'm essentially unkillable assuming that I don't do anything stupid. Now, because I think that it's important that I actually show that I completed the run with this method, and because there are a few situations and tricks that I do want to mention still, I'll keep the playback going at about a thousand percent and add some copyright free lo-fi hip-hop until something worth mentioning comes up. Feel free to use the timestamps in the video description if you wish to skip directly to the parts where I'm talking again.
Lords of Torment will always cast Wave of Suffering first, followed by Eternal Torment. You should interrupt the Wave of Suffering and then Spell Reflect the Eternal Torment, because it'll do a lot of damage to that Lord of Torment. If you come across the rare mob called Subjugator Klontzaz, he will always do the same pattern of three abilities. It's very important that you never get hit by any of them because the debuff that you get lasts for the rest of the run unless you waste the anima cell that he drops to clear them. He cannot kill you, so don't worry about maximizing your damage. Just focus on not getting hit. Whenever possible, you should be spell reflecting or interrupting Shadow Rip. When you pull larger groups of mobs that can cast this ability, for some reason it's really common for one mob to cast it first, then the rest of the mobs that are able to cast it will start their cast simultaneously like a second or two later. Because of this, whenever I pull big packs, I like to interrupt the first Shadow Rip that I see, and then spell reflect the second cast that I see. Fan of Longsword synergizes really well with Fervor of Battle because whenever Mortal Strike procs the Whirlwind, it'll also proc a Slam, meaning that you can cast three abilities from a single button press. Coldheart Scouts do exclusively range attacks, which means that we can't parry their damage with Die by the Sword. This makes them a high priority kill target. This pack caused my last death of the run, and I died because I let all the scouts just stand there and decimate me. I was hoping that I could pull just part of the room instead of the whole thing, but really I should have just committed to the fight and used Door Shadows to first get to all the scouts, second to make them take more damage, and third to give me 80% chance to dodge. I could have also used Intimidating Shout to CC some of them while I killed the rest, and also I didn't use Piercing Howl here, which would have made them all die a lot faster.
Now, there are almost certainly other classes that can do Twisting Corridors faster than Warriors. This particular Layer 8 took around 90 minutes to complete. However, it was very safe when my stupidity wasn't getting in the way. I hope this video helps you get through the Twisting Corridors. As always, I would like to hear any tricks that you figured out to make Torghast easier, and I also want you to tell me why this method is stupid and why it doesn't work as well as I think it does. Lastly, I just want to say thank you for watching this video, and subscribe for more.